Greetings, my name is Thaddeus Wilkinson, Associate Professor of Spookology at Phoenix University. I have been asked by the good folks at Foundflix to present this urgent message related to this evening's program covering Antrim, the deadliest film ever made. You might have heard rumors of the deadly and cursed nature of this film, and after researching the story of this film at our prestigious laboratory, we came to the disturbing conclusion that this film is indeed cursed and by choosing to watch this video you are putting your life in real danger in fact when I first heard its name all I did was a Google search of the title and immediately pissed myself in pure terror when I saw the poster this is the real deal pure evil we were talking about here folks so if you would prefer to be safe turn back now turn off this video immediately or if you dare to face the danger, that is your decision. And Foundflix Incorporated, along with its subsidiaries, is not legally liable for your fate. Thank you, and God bless. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to Foundflix. On this explained video, we're looking at Antrim, the deadliest film ever made, a supposedly cursed found footage style tale unearthed from the 1970s, featuring a young boy and girl who, in an attempt to rescue the soul of their deceased dog, enter a forest and dig a hole to hell. Well, that's one way to do it. This is one that kind of came out of nowhere and recently got hugely hyped after appearing on Amazon Prime, where it shot to the top most watched movie on the platform. And a ton of you guys have been asking me to cover it. I'm not sure why exactly this became so popular, assumedly because it bills itself as a cursed movie. You know, if you watch it, you die. But of course, that's a complete fabrication. Even if such a thing did exist, there's no way it's just going to wind up on Amazon Prime for anyone to watch. So you're fine. You can watch the movie. Nothing will happen, I promise, okay? Yet this still seems to have given the film an aura of being dangerous to some extent. And after all that buildup, ultimately, it left me pretty disappointed. I'm like, okay, obviously the cursed thing is total bullshit, so that doesn't really fill me with any kind of fear. And even selling it as the deadliest film ever made made me think they were gonna have some crazy weird stuff going on, really pushing the envelope. But it is actually quite tame. The actual film itself, as the movie is also padded with some talking head interviews to further sell the terror and extend the runtime, does do well at evoking the feeling of a lost 1970s film aesthetically, but just doesn't have much in the way of actual scares and the spliced in footage along with sigils popping up throughout don't really add much to the terror either. Minus one part that actually did really stick with me. Regardless, there is still a quite a bit to dissect with the movie and its cursed origins. So let's dig into Antrim, breaking down the story that evokes Dante's Inferno, along with explaining its deadly history and the ending, and how it relates to the filmmaker's idea of how a movie can create real fear in its audience. We open with a kind of docudrama, recounting movies long history of featuring the devil in some form. Skeleton horse drawn carriages, a devil dude dancing on a chair, you know, all the good stuff. And a panel of interviewees reveal the sordid history of the cursed film Antrim, being told those were just films, while Antrim is not safe. We learn back in 1988, a theater in Hungary played the movie to a packed crowd, the theater burning to the ground and killing 56. Strangely, there were multiple fires that were sourced from the audience, rather than it being the more obviously highly flammable film responsible. And as a result, Antrim became a sort of holy grail of underground cult films seen by no one, and the very few who did see it have died, then going through several film festival employees that encountered the movie and died in various fluke accidents. A woman in Colorado from a seizure, or another man electrocuted in his kitchen, and most bizarrely a man who was stung by a venomous fish, but one not normally found in the region of the attack. The case with all of them being the same. Within a day of watching Antrim, they all perished. And naturally the film festivals all rejected the film, plunging it into a Obscurity until another ill-advised screening took place in 1993 in San Francisco. This audience was aware of its supposed curse, and without fail, once the lights went down and the film started, the mood in the room turned sour, escalating into a stampede. Finding the doors mysteriously locked only further fueled their anxiety, growing into 
a full-fledged riot where 30 were trampled and injured. One pregnant woman getting killed in the fray. Hey honey, wanna go check out that cursed movie that kills people? Oh, I don't know, I am pregnant and everything. <laughs> Whatever, don't be such a worry wart. Let's go check it out. Later it was discovered that the audience members all had LSD in their bloodstream, even though they all knew they hadn't taken any. Leave it to a lowly popcorn slinger at the theater who admitted to lacing their popcorn with LSD that many in the audience ingested. Which seems like a big waste to me. I mean, doping up a bunch of strangers? I mean, this guy needs his drugs, you know? Even though many did survive this incident, none of them were willing to be interviewed. And once again, Antrim faded into obscurity. That is, until the unknown producers behind this project were watching managed to track down a copy at an estate sale. Analysis of the film revealed strange peculiarities in the sound and picture, suggesting these were deliberately inserted to create effects in the viewer. The result of it falling into the hands of a cult sometime along the way. They also discovered odd, unrelated graphic footage spliced in randomly into the film, urging the audience about its supposedly illicit nature. And after all that buildup, it's finally time to see Antrim for ourselves. Well, first, there's a big, long legal notice that really overstays its welcome, even adding a 30-second countdown clock to really hype this thing up. Or perhaps it's just an easy way to pad the runtime. You decide. The credits finally roll, and based on the titles, appears to be Russian in origin. A non-first glimpse does mimic quite well the feeling and tone of a forgotten 70s horror film. Washed out bright colors showing hillsides and a woman eerily vocalizing over musty strings. Gathered in a vet's office, a family watches over as their dog Maxine gets the big goodnight shot. A poster on the wall assuring them that all dogs go to heaven. A boy and girl waving as an angel dog ascends. Afterwards, the boy Nathan looks bummed, asking his mom if Maxine is in heaven. Uh, okay, so they speak English even though it's Russian? Sure, whatever. After some hesitation, she tells him no due to her being bad. This makes him more upset, his older sister Aurelie noticing. Suddenly, their mother disappears, the car appearing to drive itself, and turning to his sleeping sister, blood starts seeping out of her forehead, followed by a flash of a demon dude. The boy is suddenly in a red-tinged area, suffering from what appears to be nightmares, witnessing what looks like Maxine biting him, then the poor pooch burning in hellfire. Aurelie is there to comfort him, assuring him that they will see her again soon. Also spotting a triangle on the wall, which we will come to understand the meaning of later. And the next morning, they begin their hike. Reaching a precipice, she stops and asks the boy if he's sure about this, because there's no turning back now. He's confident in their plan to save the dog's soul, setting off on their hike to hell. Coming across a vigil, there are several photos and objects left behind. She explains that they are offerings left to protect this place and to keep the bad things within from getting out. Orly says that according to someone called Ike, everything here is something that somebody once loved, and in order to enter the forest, he must leave something special to him, placing down his dog's collar amongst the other objects. A sign nearby cautions them to not commit suicide as life is precious. The boy needs to take a whiz, excusing himself, and thankfully getting a POV shot of him urinating and everything. Thanks, thanks for that. Spotting a message scrawled on the bark of a tree. No one here gets out alive. Well, that's not exactly comforting, as their journey is only beginning. He momentarily can't find his sister, who catches up to him, brushing off when asked about her whereabouts, and explaining that where they are is the forest where the devil landed when he was cast out of heaven. And at the spot where he landed, they'll find that entrance to hell, the Antrim, a superimposed devil seen cackling above them in the sky. Approaching a pile of branches in a heap, this appears to be the entrance they were searching for, moving the branches out of the way with some effort. First, they set up a pentagram with rope on the ground, placing a religious object at each of the points. Pulling out a spell book, Orly offers a spell of protection. But when seeing the pages inside, it doesn't exactly look that legit. Like the drawings of a child, not really a real ancient tome of any kind. Making it seem like she's just making this whole thing up. They begin to chant in unison, getting louder and more intense. She has more advice from Ike that the deeper that they dig, the forest becomes darker with each layer passed. An obvious riff on Dante's Inferno and its specific layers of hell laid out with increasing severity and more dangerous inhabitants the deeper down that you go. After some time, he puts his ear to the ground but doesn't hear any trumpets, which indicates the first layer. She pulls him away, appearing concerned, and points out a weird stop-motion squirrel staring at them. Seriously, what is the deal with that thing? Looks like one of those Christmas shorts from the 60s, but why? She tells him that it's actually a demon in disguise, and gets him to cast it out using a stick as a wand to ward it off, the siblings laughing and running around. Ah, maybe hell ain't so bad after all. Oh, uh, on second thought, there's a bunch of corpses over there. Yeah, never mind. It, it, it's not good. Soon after, Nathan
Nathan sees something distressing. A black figure is seen poking out from behind a tree, who then disappears to the boy's confusion. The duo sit down to a nice sandwich taken in the view. Ah yes, nothing more terrifying than scenic lunches. Antrum! So scary. Hearing branches breaking behind them, they discover a Japanese man in the middle of disrobing. He clutches a bunny in his arms and sets it down, retrieving a big knife just about to plunge it into his chest. Nathan yells out, no, which stops him. The man getting irritated, yelling back at them in Japanese to leave. He gets up, packing up his briefcase and apologizes before excusing himself. Back to digging, they unearth a few treasures. First, a pill bottle, and then what looks like an antique gun. But there's no way it's loaded, right? Nathan sees some more black figures in the trees, deemed hunters, and he freaks, causing his sister to reactively fire the gun. Hmm, well, I guess it is loaded and perfectly functional after being buried for God knows how long. Getting ready to turn in for the night, Nathan continues to recite their protection prayer, hopefully, but there's a problem. He hasn't brushed his teeth. He refuses to do so, telling her she needs to wash her stinky feet. So she tries another tactic, which appears to be complete manipulation to get him to follow her instructions. She pulls out her book, informing him of Cerberus, the three-headed dog that guards the gates of hell that will tear up your body and your soul. And as long as they don't smell foul, the creature can't get them. The boy immediately heading off in a mad dash to brush his teeth. Again, all appearing to have just been a ruse by his sister to get him to do so. He's surprised by a visitor on the water, seeing a man rowing a small boat containing a naked woman passenger. She turns to look at Nathan, who hiccups in response as they paddle off into the darkness. The ferryman here is no doubt a reference to Karen, who is known for ferrying souls to the other side, via the river Styx. Having more nightmares, Nathan glimpses his dog in flames again, flipping through the pages of his sister's book, seeing a devil figure emerging from the hellmouth, and on another page, a drawing of two gross-looking redneck dudes, seeing they appear to have stolen human skin and are, in fact, demons. The nightmare climaxes in a dark image of the devil figure just staring deep into the frame, which was actually quite haunting as it lingers just a bit too long and things become unsettling. Too bad the rest of the movie couldn't pull off this level of frights. Pretty much far and away the highlight of the whole movie here, just a guy staring at you. Ah well, back to eternally digging. Orly finds Nathan sitting on a log, acting strange, and saying that something scratched him. He pulls up his arm, revealing some marks on his skin. She's worried that he might have done it to himself, but he shakes his head no, hearing whispering voices amongst the forest. She tends to the wound with some so-called holy water and gets him back on track with her plan, setting out to find Maxine. At one point, flashing to some of that other spliced-in footage, black and white, featuring a man and woman being tortured in what looks like a mental health facility. Also wearing some pretty stylish duct tape-based underwear. Orly tells him they have to find something of Maxine's called calling it a way to redeem her, catching another glimpse of the hunters following them at a distance. She hides the dog's collar in the dirt to get him to find it, but he doesn't do what she expected, saying that they are in the third layer now, despite her saying otherwise. And now hearing some nice ominous trumpeting in the air. Better late than never, devil boys. They stumble across a junkyard, encountering two men who are obvious class acts, one in the middle of humping a dead pig, and in fact are the same two men seen earlier in those drawings from Orly's book, implying that they are disguised demons as he suggested. The big goat statue in the middle, a fire burning underneath. It sounds like someone is inside, banging on the door and screaming. And based on the briefcase and stuffed bunny, it's the Japanese man being burned to his death as a kind of offering, I would assume, to their evil master. This sends the siblings fleeing in terror back to their camp. Orly tries to pack their stuff up to go, but Nathan refuses to give up on his dog, returning to the hole and futilely digging, her promising that they'll come back and sent into double time, noticing a black cloud in the sky. Hmm, who's up for Japanese? She pulls him away, running through the woods, seeing more black figures prowling between the branches. Reaching a boat, they climb aboard and leave the shore. Soon after, Nathan vanishes, sending Orly into the water to retrieve him from the murky depths. The boy talking backwards, then reverting back to their protection chant. Arriving at the other side, for some unknown reason, they seem to think they have reached freedom. Both triumphant, taking in the sunset and embracing. Yet when they continue onwards, find themselves right back at their camp, and indeed, they have not escaped their nightmare. Things only getting more frightening, Nathan noticing what must be the chains of Cerberus, the beast growling and they take refuge in the tent. Nathan retrieves her book, trying to find answers, and thinking the beast must have gotten loose from its chains, she tosses the book outside, finally coming clean that she has lied to him about everything, and made up the entire hole to hell and everything up to this point. She believed, and I don't know why, that this would help him to get over their dog's death. She's not sure how the idea of it being in hell got into his head, which if she paid more attention, it was their mom that suggested this back in the car, and she thought 
this experience would help him with his resulting nightmares. But more bizarrely, there are several actual real elements at play here, and it seems despite her making everything up, that what she created has actually come into reality, which is further reinforced by Nathan. He admits he actually knew beforehand that she was tricking him, because he met her supposedly made up friend Ike. Following her instructions to find him, he waited in an alley by a diner, a black arm reaching out from behind a dumpster and drawing him closer. He meets a long haired silhouette of a being, and as Nathan says, the being showed him things, putting two fingers on his forehead. Like what, she asks? Well, like the whole thing about her trickery by using the collar, just as she did, pulling out the collar from her pocket, showing his premonition to be true. And again, this whole thing wouldn't have been part of her make-believe, so something very real and very evil is going on in these woods. Like the ever unseen Cerberus hearing its chains and growling, sending them both running in terror. Once again, Orly misfires, hitting the beast's chain, which is a good shot, kind of, but appears to unleash the monster. Holding her brother and singing, we again see more splice footage of the hospital. It is coming, written on the wall as they move on to the fourth layer, flashing back to the incident where this whole thing started in more detail. The family is seen having a nice picnic at the park along with their peckish pooch Maxine. Most likely jealous of their delicious looking spread, he bites the boy's arm. This moment being the actual cause of those scratches his sister treated with holy water and the reason why Maxine was put down, starting their whole insane journey. Along with a flash of his new puppy pal, the three-headed dog Cerberus. Seeing these are actually Orly's nightmares for a change, she wakes up to another nightmare. The redneck dudes at their camp and digging through their stuff. They try to quietly sneak away, but an ill-advised wand attack from Nathan dooms them both, each getting tranquilized and captured by the wards of evil, leading to our big climax. Two gross dudes who have captured two children in wire cages. Deadliest film ever made! The relatively grosser one goes for the boy, stuffing him into the belly or indeed antrum of the statue, one stoking the fire while Orly screams and kicks at the crate, managing to get free. She gets a shot off on one, pissing off the pig pervert guy, and she keeps shooting, eventually a shot connecting. He retreats to the truck and starts to drive off, but they don't get too far, crashing a mere few feet later. Cutting again back to the hospital footage, a woman holding a gun to the man's head. It looks like she's being forced to do so, with a weird metal pole sticking out from out of frame. And things have obviously gotten more intense for the two, the lady's eyes both gouged out. Checking the truck, both are dead, and now somehow they have moved on to level 5, which at this point doesn't seem to even correlate with them digging or anything anymore. Sure, whatever you say guys, level 5 it is. Nathan, who fled from the Antrim statue in the shootout, was now all blackened with soot like he's a friggin' Yosemite Sam or something. Anyway, he hears a dog crying nearby. Could it be? Maxine? Could have all this been worth it? He chases the sound to an area, and snarled in overgrown branches, spotting blood on the bark but continuing on, hearing the chains of Cerberus rattling nearby. He comes to a clearing, still hearing the chains, finding a dog there trapped in a bear trap, the actual source of the chains clanging. Yet it is not Maxine, a different breed of dog entirely. Also, it's most likely the redneck boys whose trap the dog has been caught in. Nathan sets it free from the trap, and the dog gratefully runs off, pausing a moment before vanishing into the woods. The boy still clutching the trap, and smash cut to credits. Uh, the end? Certainly abrupt, this is the first of two endings presented, and I guess the meaning to take away here is throughout Nathan's time in the Hell Forest, he's been searching for some way to set his dog's soul free, which after losing her caused him all those nightmares. And here the dog, even if not Maxine, acts as potentially the same idea. He helps the trapped animal, and in that way has set it free. Ultimately, he did get what he was looking for in the end here. But then I'm still like, uh, where the heck did his sister go? And unsurprisingly, another scene shows us our second and final ending after a triangle symbol pulses on screen for a while. Orly is found alone in the woods in search of her brother. Demonic voices surrounding her, struggling through terrain, she stumbles, seeing other unfortunate souls remains that have been taken, glimpsing the demon hunters up in the trees watching. Returning to their tent and not finding her brother, she begins undoing what she started, putting the branches back and tearing up the book she made, setting fire to the pages, and hopelessly trying to refill the hell portal that they dug. The hunter is still surrounding her, she has no other choice than to hide in the tent with her gun at the ready and wait. Hearing chains, assuming them those of Cerberus, she calls out for Nathan through tears. Establishing an easy mix-up, he is seen still carrying the bear trap, and actually that is behind the chain rattling sound again. But she doesn't know better, the sound getting louder and drawing to her door. She fires at Nathan as the film ends, which really leaves us to think she accidentally gently shot her brother right in the face, and things don't fare much better for the other couple, both seen dead on the floor. The devil guy popping out of the hole to say hello, and the film sputters away. A note on screen informing us that we've just witnessed Antrim
spectrum in its entirety. Oh, okay, well that was uh, certainly something, but I don't feel especially cursed after watching two kids dig a hole and wander around the woods for an hour, not exactly feeling the terror, you know? But we're not done yet. As the credits roll, we return to the docudrama style and learn more about the cursed film and its devilish intentions. The still unknown producers behind this documentary discovered some peculiarities in the film as they mentioned, such as audio signals and of course many, many sigils drawn over the frames, all designed to instill a response in the viewer. And even the triangle symbol in the first ending is associated with manifestation, like calling forth the devil or what have you. Another guy knows all about the specific demon associated with the sigil scene, called Astaroth, and these symbols are intended as an invitation, asking the demon, do you want to play? He recalls the story of a village in the 17th century where children decided to evoke the demon, and the whole town was found two weeks later all dead. Others were found walking in circles, having gouged out their own eyes, which gives context to that weird splice black and white footage. At one point, seeing the woman has gouged out one of her own eyes, these two must have been previous victims of the demon, even with that it is coming written on the wall. It's got to be referring to the guy, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense otherwise. The whole idea with Antrim and how it ties in with the movie story and the cursed film aspect is the idea of believing something so much that it becomes real. This is what Oralee and Nathan went through in the woods. While it was initially all just make-believe, it seems that by evoking the demon that it did in fact open a doorway to hell, just as they were foolishly attempting to do in the first place. Same goes for the cult that manipulated the film and added the sigils and whatnot, just as the children who were unknowingly evoking it, asking, do you want to play? The movie itself has the same purpose, an imagined truth that it can be so frightening to actually cause its viewers to die by watching. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this in-depth explained video on Antrim, the deadliest film ever made. While certainly not scary or thrilling enough to warrant such a title, I did like some of the concepts the movie was playing with, even though it ultimately felt a lot less compelling in execution. I feel if they had fleshed out some things some more and added more to the meta side of things, again, what even happened to the filmmakers of the movie in the first place or the kid actors or anything like that. Was it always evil or was it found later or what? I don't know. There's just a whole bunch of stuff that they could have utilized to help flesh out the movie's world and actually feel a lot more real as a result as well. As it is, it feels like two different things that don't quite jive together. The docudrama element and the movie itself, which clocks in at just about one hour. And even that feels woefully drawn out. Deadliest film ever made not by a long shot. What did you guys think of Antrim and its ending? Do you have any other theories or interpretation of the movie and its supposed curse? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.